Well, um, my name is Robin Philpott. I'm publisher of Baraka Books. And uh, uh, I want to thank you for attending this. A very a good attendance for an online Zoom. Um, one of the advantages, and I've said this in our other launches, is that <clears throat> we can reach people in different places, uh, different cities, different continents sometimes. And uh, so we're almost like Alfred T. Wood. We can hop from one place to the next um, without skedaddling, as Frank says. Uh, the program tonight, is, this is what we propose, is um, I'm going to explain why we publish a book like this, because uh, we're a small publisher and we only publish books that we like, and I'll explain why. Um, then I'll ask Frank to explain you know, run over the life of this man who he, who is, he's dubbed as the great absquatulator um, and, uh, and some of the research he's done uh, because it is massive research. Um, and then we will ask Webster uh, to explain why he chose, why he wanted to write a forward for it and what he thinks is the most, what are the relevant aspects about A.T. Wood's life and then there'll be a question and answer period. I think uh, Webster has a couple of questions he wants to ask and then we open the floor and then I will ask Frank to make some concluding remarks and we should be over shortly after eight o'clock. So why, do, uh, why would we publish a book like this? Well, first of all, um, it's an honor to receive a manuscript from somebody like Frank Mackey. I didn't know Frank, but uh, I'd heard about him, I'd read about him, I read, I'd, I'd, I'd browsed through some of his books and I have to admit I hadn't read them, but I, I, I did notice his, the seriousness of his work. And then when Frank also said that it was Webster who insisted um, that he get it published because it was, you know, he hadn't quite finished it up and he spent a lot of time working on it. And so I said, well, there's, there's two honors. Um, I, I had never met Webster until tonight. We're actually meeting in person online, but um, I knew about his work. I knew about his, his, the seriousness of what he does and his research and his uh, public uh, intervention and, and so on. So that, that was two big strikes in favor of publishing the book. Um, and so we decided to do it. When uh, George Eliot Clark, you know, because he's originally from Halifax, and we think that maybe A.T. Wood was born there. So we asked him to comment on it, to, uh, to write a blurb, as they call it. And he wrote a nice blurb, and they said in, bracket, in, in uh, between dashes, almost recess, obsessive research. But you know, all research is a bit obsessive. And thankfully, it is so. Because if you're not satisfied with um, received ideas about things, then you have to be a bit obsessive. And you know that was what uh, Flaubert called uh, les idées reçues. And uh, I've got a job for Frank next is to update the Dictionnaire des idées reçues uh, that uh, Flaubert had written. But so so it, it, it when you know it's really a compliment when he says this is obsessive research because frankly, I think most research is obsessive because you are determined to get through all the fog and actually get to the meat of what, what, what happened in, in a period. Um, in this book, as the, and I'll leave it up to Frank and Webster to uh, provide the right words to describe A.T. Wood, but you learn about every place he went and you learn things that, you know, sometimes you think you know a subject a bit, but then you run into a guy like Frank and you realize how little you do know. Uh, about a subject, about a subject, a period. Um, and, and so in this, in this book, you learn about the places from Maine and New Brunswick to Boston, to Liberia a couple of times, to England, Ireland, Germany, then Montreal, uh, then the US, uh, uh, the Midwest and the South. You know, I mean, you actually learn about those places and you learn about um, the period and things that you might not have imagined how people lived through it. So, and Frank's got these wonderful uh, 
storytelling skills. And so um, I, I'm gonna, I really recommend getting the book and you can buy it from Baraka Books, of course. So I would now ask Frank to, uh, to take over and tell us a bit about the man, the book, the research. So there it is. Thanks, thanks, uh, Robin. Um, Robin actually is lucky. He has at least two reasons he knows why he published this book. Ask me if I know why I wrote it. I'm not sure. Um, but I know you're all here wanting to, to know why absquatulator, why that word as the title of the book, and what does it mean? Well, I mean, the, uh, the idea was the word was born or lived at the time that A.T. Wood did. It's sort of a word that came up in the middle of the 19th century. And it reminded me of a word uh, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, where there's one of the characters at a certain point is talking about some ignorant Negro who doesn't collucitate. Uh, how the world works. And I remember seeing that word, collucitate, and think that's a wonderful word, <laughs> you know? It, it doesn't exist, but you can get the meaning right away. It's that somebody doesn't grasp what it means. Well, in the case of that, think becomes more obvious if you think about it a little bit. It's like ab as in abscond, you know, and squat. So get off the squat and go. So that's what it is. That squatulator is somebody who takes off, you know, who uh, who escapes. Uh, so I mean, that's one reason I took it, and it sounded like a word that came from vaudeville or from black minstrel shows at the time, like the word interlocutor that you get in uh, vaudeville or that kind of thing. You know, it just it has a certain ring to it that is not not super serious and not super comical either. It just seems a kind of ambiguous uh, sort of word. So, uh, I mean, that's the reason I chose that. And I have to say, if there's anybody here who is French speaking, je vais vous dire que avec une personne qui travaillait anciennement chez Urtubise à la maison d'édition Urtubise, uh, J'avais discuté d'une traduction de Absquatulator. Elle se demandait qu'est-ce que c'est en français Absquatulator. Alors, on a fait, on, a, on en a discuté um, à, en courriel, avec des courriels, et uh, je lui ai dit ben, c'est une personne qui s'esquive, qui se pousse, qui se dérobe, qui déguerpille, qui, ou comme on dit au Québec, comme on disait, qui déguédine. Mm -hmm. Euh, je l'avais suggéré « escampetteur », comme quelqu'un qui prend la poudre d'escampette. Et elle a suggéré « esquiveur »,« oh, décampeur euh, ». Et puis, elle a fini par dire « dans toutes les expressions qu'on a utilisées, il manque le côté « mot-valise » qu'il y a dans l'expression anglaise euh, ». Alors, j'ai suggéré « bon ben, absentireur euh, » déguerpicante ou déguerpicampiste, euh, tire-toi de là, terre, tire-toi de là, triste, <rire> qui t'en douceur, qui t'en douceuse, euh, foule campien, foule campien, puis elle finit par dire qu'elle aimait bien foule campiste. Alors en français, disons que ça veut dire foule campiste, le mot, la traduction de Absquatulator. Um, as Robin indicated, this is a story, and it's written as a story, about a, uh, a black man of the 19th century who seems to have come from Halifax. I haven't established that 100% or anything, but he seems to have come from Halifax and gone to Maine posing as a, um, a missionary. And uh, what he was doing there is not clear. He went around collecting money, um, but it was a, after a while people complained that he, he didn't seem like a minister in his off hours. He rarely spoke of religion. Uh, 
But what it seems he was after was a wife. And it seems that he wanted a white wife, uh, a white wife who would give him some kind of advantage in society. And he found the girl uh, in Maine, but in Maine, it was against the law for whites or native people or blacks to intermarry. So you couldn't do it. If you did it, it was the marriage wasn't recognized. And the marriage wasn't recognized if you say skipped over the border to New Brunswick and got married there and then went back to Maine, which is what A.T. Wood did. He went and married his girl over in New Brunswick across the border and, uh, and then returned to Maine. And then they sort of chased after him, a posse went after him. They went and captured him in New Brunswick uh, and brought him back to Maine, which is illegal. You know, it was an illegal thing. And why there was no, uh, no intervention from the British authorities or the people in New Brunswick or anything, I don't know. I suspect it was because he was a black man and they couldn't care less. But they, this was a blatantly illegal act where you had a posse that went into New Brunswick, grabbed uh, A.T. Wood, brought him back to Maine, where the girl's father had charged him with fornication because they weren't married. And if they're not married, well, they're fornicating. And uh, they, they didn't charge his wife, but they charged him. And he spent a little more than four months in jail uh, on this charge. When it finally came up for trial, nobody showed up. No witnesses, no prosecution or anything. Uh, because I think that the people who were there probably realized they would cause a real stink if they came up and, and explained how this person came to be accused in Maine of fornication. So he was released and he and his wife left there, made their way down to Boston where Almost immediately, he became the minister of this Baptist, Black Baptist Church in Boston, which is now the African American History Museum in Boston. Uh, it's like a historic church, the oldest church building, Black church building uh, in, uh, I think, in the United States. It's still standing. Um, and uh, so he was named, they were chosen pastor there. And uh, in no time, in the spring of 1840, 1850, he, um, somebody turns up and says he was, he was claiming to be um, Reverend A.T. Wood from Liverpool, England. And uh, somebody turns up and tells the church, that's no Reverend A.T. Wood from Liverpool. That's George Albert Smith from Halifax. I know his family. I know, I know him. I know his relatives. So what happens next is um, Reverend A.T. Wood absquatulates. He takes off to New York. Um, and at New York, he, uh, he starts discussions with uh, representatives of the American Colonization Society, who are the organization that are shipping Black uh, African Americans from uh, the states to Liberia. So uh, they, um, the head of it in New York, the head of the New York organization, decides to send him to Liberia with his wife, where he's going to be, um, you know, one of the settlers there. And uh, so he, he goes off to Liberia, I mean, he no sooner gets there than he is chosen as the pastor of the uh, Providence Baptist Church in Liberia, founded in 1821-22. It's, uh, it's sort of the oldest Christian church, I think, in Liberia. Um, so there he is in September 1850. He lands there in August. He he, in September, he's a pastor. At the beginning of December, he's named chaplain to the Senate. I mean, this guy really knows how to work the magic, you know? And he, uh, and then the following June, he's only been there about nine months. The following June, he decides to go to England to raise some money for his church. So he takes off for England, lands in Liverpool, uh, starts going around the country and Wales and Ireland collecting funds uh, supposedly either to build a church, 
to finish his church or whatever, he, different stories. But uh, he eventually in Hull in England, birthplace of William Wilberforce, the great champion of anti-slavery, in Hull, um, he comes to grief, among other reasons, because he claims that uh, members of his congregation in Liberia include George and, is it Eliza or Emily? Anyways, heroes of Uncle Tom's Cabin. He claims that they are members of his congregation and that he knows them. And in some cases it works. People give him money on the basis of this story, except that there are some people who say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know? And uh, so anyways, he's, he ends up being charged with uh, soliciting under false pretenses. And uh, on New Year's Day, 1853, he has his trial and he's convicted. And the judge tells him, you know, uh, for what you did, I could send you to Australia for seven years, transportation to Australia for seven years. Uh, Mr. Wood by then is married to his third wife. I forgot to mention that uh, his wives, earlier wives had died, but he, uh, and he sort of pleads, you know, oh, I'll be, on behalf of my partner, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not be hasty. So anyway, he gets sentenced to 18 months in the House of Correction in Hull. Um, so he's inside for that period. And uh, in Germany and publishes what is he calls a history of Liberia in German. Um, I think it's based on the lectures he gave in um, Ireland and England and, and in Wales. And he um, uh, has it translated into German, which uh, people here, uh, Elisabeth Moff and uh, Louis Bouchard translated back into English for me. Um, and, uh, and you sort of wonder, what is he doing in Germany? Is he planning to raise, to go around Germany and, and raise money or, or what? Because he doesn't speak the language, doesn't know anything about it. But uh, he, uh, he doesn't hang around there. He leaves uh, Hamburg and goes back to Liberia. And of course, Liberia is trouble because they've kept abreast of everything he said when he was in England and Ireland and all that. And he gave this completely false picture of what Liberia was all about. Um, so that he goes back there and he's charged with raising money under false pretenses. and. Uh, and a libel upon the Republic. Um, I think that's because when he was in England, he claimed to have the support of the president of Liberia and the cabinet and all this sort of stuff. So that they were all, they had their names dragged through the mud in England. So he gets sentenced to five years, five years at hard labor in chains in Liberia in the middle of the 19th century. I mean, you don't have to think too hard to realize that that's, that's pretty much of a death sentence to do something like that. But this is A.T. Wood. Uh, that happened early in 1855, his conviction. In the spring of 1857, he's teaching at a school in the, out in the country in Liberia. Um, and, and that's the last we hear of him in Liberia. The next thing we know, he's in Montreal. And in Montreal, he claims to be the superintendent of public works from Sierra Leone. Um, so uh, he gives a few lectures here. He's doing quite well. He's hatching projects for uh, black Montrealers. The, one of them is the idea to build a, um, I think a school, a night school or to give night classes and uh, a reading room, I think, to create a reading room for uh, Black Montrealers. That, so he gets here in the June 1859, and everything is going well. There's a, the uh, Webster will probably talk later about John Brown, uh, who was captured that fall uh, in October and, uh, and hanged in, uh, um, in Virginia. But um, 
you know, everything, and he's, A.T. Wood is sort of the leader of the meetings and prayers for John Brown at that time. The, um, and then he's, uh, everything is going hunky-dory. He's got the support. The, there's the um, ministers, Protestant ministers in Montreal, all sign this, these testimonials to him uh, about how the work he's doing and how they're behind him 100% and all that. And, um, and then all of a sudden, uh, at the beginning of March or so, he's gone. He sort of absquatulated and you sort of wonder, where did he go? Why did he go? There was no scandal there as there was in the other places he'd been before. There was no, uh, nobody exposed him as a fraud. Uh, you know, so there was no problem that way, but he just sort of disappears. And uh, I had trouble finding him because at first there were some cases in Vermont, a couple of cases in Vermont, New Hampshire, um, Maine, where somebody, a black man was going around or black men were going around claiming to be raising money for uh, Liberia and lecturing in churches, and that, which is exactly what A.T. Wood had been doing. But uh, I soon found out, no, it's not him because he made straight from Montreal to Cincinnati. And that's one of the puzzles about this A.T. Wood character is his absquatulations is that you don't know what made him decide to go from Montreal to Cincinnati of all places. Uh, did, he, did he read some kind of a bulletin from uh, a ministerial organization that people in Cincinnati were looking for a minister or something? I don't know, but he turns up there and at first he claims to be raising money to set up uh, reading room and classes for black Montrealers. Right at the very beginning, He's using that as a pretext, but then that disappears very quickly. And he's just there in uh, Ohio. And he spends the next three years going around Ohio. Um, then, then he's in Indiana and finally in Chicago as a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And uh, he, uh, he stays there until 1865 where everything blows up because then he's accused of one thing, trying to raise money without authorization to go to California. And another thing, which is another offense, which is never named, but which a bishop of the church in uh, Illinois says is one of the highest crimes under heaven. You never learn what it is that he's supposed to have done. but but it seems to be very serious. Nobody wants to say openly what it is. I have a feeling it has something to do with a sexual offense of some sort. And um, he ends up being tried at the conference of the church in uh, August 19, 1865. And uh, he, uh, he is acquitted. He's sort of convicted of one charge and acquitted of the other, but then they decide, okay, well, Let's acquit him of everything and clean the slate. But he's suspended for a year. So he's acquitted, but he's suspended. And you sort of, what, what does this mean? Uh, the bishop who accused him of committing one of the highest crimes under heaven is, is upset about this. He's, uh, he wants the editor of the church paper to explain you know, what the true business is, but it never, it never comes out. And, and then A.T. Wood disappears again. He's, he absquatulates. He's gone from Illinois and you wonder, where is he? Where is he? I finally found him in Nashville, Tennessee, of all places. Why would he go south like that? So he goes to Nashville and in no time in Nashville, he's claiming to be not, before he had been claiming to be a doctor of divinity. In Nashville, he becomes an MD and claims to have a degree from Cambridge University in England and practicing medicine for 30 years. <laughs> it takes some nerve on his part, but that's what he is. That's, he's, he's all nerve. He's not, uh, he's not conscience or, uh, or concern or anything like that. He's just all nerve. Uh, so he, he practices medicine down in Nashville, then in uh, Murfreesboro, not too far away. And, uh, 
with when Tennessee opens, uh, gives black males the right to vote, um, they, they court some black leader, black uh, leaders to uh, join the Republican party. Uh, and among others, there's A.T. Wood, the Reverend A.T. Wood, who is this smart dude. And uh, he's recruited. He goes stumping around the state for uh, the Republican party. And in uh, 1868, he's elected an alternate delegate to the Republican National Convention, which is to take place in Chicago that uh, May, I think it's May 22nd, 20, 21st, 22nd, something like that. And uh, then he dies. That's his ultimate absquatulation on in preparing to go to Chicago for this, this sort of summit of his career in a way. He, uh, he died of a, a heart attack. And that was the end of it. Uh, there seems to be no trace of a burial. There was one little line in one newspaper saying that he had died. And in the county records of Murfreesboro, the, the county authorities in, I think, July um, authorized the payment of $5 to this carpenter to build a coffin for him. And that's it. There's no, no other record of his death. You wonder then when you see that, like, is this another absquatulation? Has he sort of disappeared again and gone somewhere else or what? But no, it seems that he did really die. Um, so there I told you more than you wanted to know that uh, A.T. Wood, <laughs> but you have, to, you have to read it to see how he did it. He, uh, it's just, it is amazing to see that he could get away, he did. Now, I won't, I will stop here and not go any farther, but I will say one thing is his relations with women were an odd thing because that first wife that he married in New Brunswick, he took her to Liberia. On the way, he was accused of beating her. Uh, in Liberia, shortly after they arrived, she died. Um, and he married an African woman uh, in Liberia, or at least he married a woman uh, the daughter, stepdaughter of one of the settlers, a member of the government, government. Uh, and he took her with him to England shortly after marrying her, and she died. Um, and then a few months later, he married an English woman. He yeah. took her with him to Germany when he went there, but uh, she sort of disappears after that. I don't know what happened to her, if she went back to England or, or what, but, uh, but you have to wonder that and a, an incident in uh, um, Nashville later on where he adopts a young girl, 15 year old black girl, and she gets pregnant and there are suggestions that he is the one who made her pregnant. Uh, so it's all very, uh, very odd, his relations with women. And I remember at one time thinking that she, uh, that he may be a kind of a Bluebeard character. He just, if he's not killing them actively, that he's somehow killing them from neglect, you know, by neglecting them. Anyway. So the, anyway, Frank, <clears throat> the danger is that the people are not going to buy the book because you're going <laughs> to tell Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm saying too much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, but I, because there's a lot more. Yeah. Um, I would like now maybe Webster can ex can um, explain what you know what brought him to be interested in this book and and to write it forward and and why is it relevant today his story? Well, thank you very much and thank you, Frank. Yeah, I could have uh, sit here and I read the story before it was published. Uh, I read it. You told it to me and I was still like <laughs> um, was, I was still listening to you and I could, I could have been going on for hours um, so yeah um, when uh, I was asked to write the, the forward uh, I was really honored uh, to be able to to write it uh, for my my Frank uh, my, my Frank my friend Frank, <laughs> um, as I'm 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 saying in the the forward uh, we met at the uh, lecture about um, Black history about African Quebecois history, 
And I was, uh, I, I knew Frank. Uh, I didn't know what he looked like, but I knew his work because I was reading his work and really passionate about his work. And we were sitting like side to side and he, he asked me, what, what was my name? And I said, Ali, and, and what's yours? I said, Frank, Frank McKee. I was like, oh, the Frank McKee. And I, you know, I was blown away. Sometimes, you know, people will meet rock stars or, you know, meet great rappers. To me, I was meeting Frank McKee. <laughs> so I was starstruck. And, um, you know, uh, since then, we've been, you know, corresponding a lot. And he fed me so so many informations and uh, everything I do now uh, I owe a lot to Frank McKee. So when I was asked to write the foreword, I was I, 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 I was struck and I was honored. And um, to me, the, that this work is so important. Uh, the work Frank does about. Uh, uh, the history of uh, people of African descent in Montreal, in Quebec, in Canada, it is so important because, because it is something that has been overlooked. And when we talk about slavery, when we talk about resistance to slavery, Frank uh, taught me a lot. But now what, what is interesting and important about this book in particular is the fact that it's not somebody that was enslaved. It's not somebody who... who I was about to say he was not a victim. Well, he's, he's a crook. And, and that's what's interesting about this story. Because, uh, and we talked about it a lot, uh, Frank and me, about the fact that often, you know, when we talk about the uh, um, African-American experience, American, you know, in the sense of the continent, we we'll, uh, often talk about slavery, we we'll often talk about victims. Um, but... You know, it's not dichotomic. You know, the, the, there are a lot of gray areas also. And um, A.T. Woods sits in that gray area. And it, it shows the complexity of uh, people of African descent in the Americas who had to deal with racism, with systemic racism, but also had to deal with their inner demons, you know. For, um, and that's what... Um, that's what was uh, A.T. Wood to me. And, you know, in the, the foreword, uh, I do this comparison, which, um, how could I say that? I compare him, compare him to Malcolm X. Not because uh, of his militancy, no, but because A.T. Wood was smart. He was smart, but systemic racism pushed him in a way that if he would have been white in the 19th century in the United States, he would have become, I don't know, could have become president or whatever, you know, because he would have had all these doors open to him. And, and uh, I compare him to Malcolm X because there is this... Um, this story, you know, which is canon, you know, where um, uh, young Malcolm Little uh, is in the classroom with his, I think it's, it's his uh, English teacher who asked him what you want to do when you grow up. And he said, lawyer. And then he said, no, it's not a job for an N word, you know, uh, why don't you become um, a menuisier? I forgot the, the, the name, a woodworker, you know. And to me, that's, that's racism and systemic racism, you know, and from then on, Malcolm X went into, uh, Malcolm Little went into a life of crime before being jailed and uh, coming out as Malcolm X. So to me, these are two, um, two persons uh, who were incredibly smart, but because of systemic racism, chose uh, different uh, life paths. Uh, that if they would have been white, they would have had like all the opportunities in the world. So to me, that's what uh, A.T. Wood embodies, you know. Uh, and so that's uh, true is uh, this complexity uh, that this work is important. And then it ties the United States to Liberia, obviously, but then to Europe, to Montreal, to Canada. And it shows also that you know, the uh, African-American past, still in the, you know, in the con continental uh, view, 
uh, is not confined to uh, to nations. You know, they are these are transnational. You know, we think about. <clears throat> You know, the exact same era, we think about Harriet Tubman, you know, went from the United States to Canada, back and forth. We think about Samuel, uh, Samuel Ringgold Ward, who, um, who was in the United States, then went to, to Canada, and, and uh, many of them, you know, and John Brown, we we'll talk about him uh, in a little bit, you know, wanted to make Canada this um, base arrière. I don't know how to say it in English but uh, he re his rear base for his armed revolution against slavery. So uh, many of those people, you know, used to be back and forth in between the United States and Canada. And this is, I, I think, the laugh of um, A.T. Wood shows also. And, you know, uh, for those who haven't read uh, the book, uh, I do this uh, kind of comparison also, uh, you know, I compare a lot. I'm a rapper, you know, so <laughs> I use comparisons and metaphors and stuff like that. So, so I compare him also. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Thomas, thank you very much for the, what, what you're saying. He says, I disagree Webster with the Malcolmist comparison. Wood was a trickster without the moral conscience. I, I totally agree. Uh, and uh, the, the comparison to me is only the fact that those two were smart and their, um, the setting, the racial setting, the racist setting of those societies back then pushed them into uh, different paths, you know, uh, and paths of, of, of crime, you know. Um, so uh, I, I agree with the fact that you disagree with me. Um, so this is why I say that you read, you understand what I was uh, get, getting at, you know, but thank you for your comment. I think that is, it, it's, it, it is important uh, to un, um, underline it. So what was about, was about to say is that I've um, compared um, the laugh of uh, Alfred uh, Thomas Wood with the story of uh, um, Frank, uh, what, what, what his name? Frank um, Abagnale. Abagnale, Abagnale, yeah, thank you. Uh, who's the author of Catch Me If You Can, you know, who pretended to be um, different, uh, like he pretended to be a doctor and an airline pilot and whatever, whatever. And I crossed it with uh, Forrest Gump. You know, because when you, you, you watch Forrest Gump, he's been like to Vietnam and the protest against Vietnam and the start of the AIDS epidemic and um, uh, pandemic. And so Gump have been through all the different uh, big events of the 20th century. And that's what happened with A.T. Wood. So A.T. Wood pretended to be so many things, you know, he pretended to be a uh, reverend and pretended to be architect and superintendent and this and that. And I've been uh, in Liberia, you know, uh, about uh, 20 to 30 years after it was founded, been on stage with William Lloyd Garrison and, and Robert Morris and Samuel Ringgold Ward and Henry Bibb in Boston, you know, uh, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed in 1850. And he was a pastor of the um, first independent Baptist church in Boston. And then went in England when all those abolitionist leaders used to, to raise money, you know, and there was in Montreal. And he, he opened the, the, the vigil for John Brown. When John Brown uh, was um, executed, you know, he, um, he wanted to, to arm uh, people who were enslaved in the United States to have this armed rebellion against um, slavery in the United States, you know, and uh, it didn't work and then was hung for that. And there was a vigil in Montreal. And <laughs> who opens the vigil with a prayer? A.D. Wood. <laughs> and then <laughs> he's in the Midwest uh, during the Reconstruction era. So to me, it's a real life Forrest Gump, you know, who've been... Yeah, through all those those big events uh, events in the 19th century, so this life is so interesting, and to me it had to be uh, put in a book, and um, 
And I'll end on that note, and afterward we can proceed to the questions. But uh, as I said, you know, uh, with Frank, we've been like uh, corresponding for a long time now. And then uh, I think we were talking about Paula Brown, who used to be kind of a trickster too in Canada. And he said, oh, but there's one who's worse, you know, <laughs> A.T. Wood. I was like, who's A.T. Wood? And he sent me the first chapter. I was like, oh, wow, I need to read the next one. And he sent me the second chapter and then the third and the fourth. And I was like, well, why don't you publish it, right? And this is uh, how, how it went. So uh, to me, I'm glad that uh, Robin picked up <laughs> the great Absquatulator, was able to, to publish it, and now people will be able to read it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you, Webster. It's it is a, a great to get these two two ways of looking at the man and the book. Um, before we go on, I just want to say there are quite a number of people here that I you know I, I should name. There's there's authors with uh, Baraka books and other people, um, and uh, I you know I I'll just mentioned Luke Byrne. We we launched his his novel two weeks ago, Fox Hunt. Um, there's David Bourgeois, whose book we'll be publishing next year. We have a manuscript from Patricia Scarlett. I noticed Afua Cooper is here online and welcome. And I'm sure I'm, I'm not doing, uh, doing justice to the other people who are present, but I did want to mention um, their presence. So perhaps I, I know you had a question or two, Webster, that you could direct to Frank. And, but then we want to leave the floor open. So, you know, uh, I would ask Frank to keep his answers short so that everybody can ask a question. So before we lose uh, some of our players who decide to abscotulate. So go ahead, uh, Webster. Yes, I have so many questions. Um, but uh, maybe I'll ask one and um, it is, how do you pick up his trace? Like you, sorry, I was muted. I don't know uh, if you understood what I was saying, but um, uh, as I said, I have many questions, but I I'll ask, how do you pick up his trace? Like you, you lose him, let's say in Montreal, how do you, you, you find him back? And then, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, you found him on, on three continents. So how, how does it happen? Uh, some of it, some of it is uh, accidental, and it, it, in some cases, it takes a while. And I must say, at some point after he left Chicago in uh, 1855, I lost him. I didn't had no idea where he was, and uh, but I found a man who um, used exactly the same kind of method, and I was convinced at a certain point that it was him. There's a fellow who called himself. W. A. T. Smith in uh, New England, a uh, black man who claimed to be raising money, claimed to have been to Liberia, claimed to be raising money for, in fact, what he was raising money for was for a home for young African girls whose parents threw them to the alligators because they wanted boys, they didn't want girls. So he was, he was running this routine like that and also organizing concerts. He would whip together a bunch of young girls and boys, teenagers, uh, into a choir and go touring around uh, uh, giving performances. Um, so I was convinced for a while. I even wrote the, the manuscript. And the thing about it, it turned out that W.A.T. Smith was a homosexual predator uh, preying on teenage boys. And when I found that, I thought, oh, that would explain A.T. Wood's obsquatulations. That's why he moved around so much, is that he was gay. And not only was he gay, but he was a sexual predator. So he had to be, keep moving on. But uh, as it turned out, that was totally wrong. Um, but it really shocked me when I found out, no, that's not true. That's not him. He, that's somebody else altogether. Um, and uh, W.A.T. Smith, as it turns out, died in the Eastern State Penitentiary in uh, uh, Philadelphia 
1889, I think, where he had been sentenced to five years in prison. But uh, so then I uh, finally, I, I did find um, a record of uh, A.T. Wood in Nashville. I don't remember how that happened, but I found A.T. Wood in Nashville and I looked more closely into it. And sure enough, that's who it was. And with recognizable practices and uh, um, uh, you know the, the whole thing. But uh, yeah, as far as Liberia, it was easy enough because when he left Boston, he went to New York and there um, he went to a meeting where some Liberian representatives were giving a lecture on Liberia and uh, trying to get some African Americans to go over there. And I guess maybe that's what gave him the idea. So he goes over um, to, to uh, Liberia and then it's clear there that he wants to go to England to raise money. So you sort of follow him to England and in England you follow him and see him going off to Wales, going off to Ireland. I think at one point he may even have gone to Scotland but I have no information on that. Uh, mostly in England. Um, and then uh, when he comes out of there, um, I, at one point I found out, I, it must be like from the internet, from Googling, from something, I find A.T. Wood, the author of this history of Liberia in German. I went to the uh, uh, New York Public Library. They had the manuscript there. They had a, not the manuscript, but they had a copy of the book there. And uh, sure enough, this is him, because <laughs> the book, much of the book is, is the same material as he used in his lectures in, uh, in Britain uh, and Ireland. And um, so that's interesting. And then looking through the American Colonization Society journals, they put out a regular monthly journal and some other publications, regular publications, and you find his trace in there. So I followed him there and uh, the fact that he's convicted. Um, and then at a certain point, again, I got in touch with the Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention archives um, in Richmond, Virginia, and in uh, Tennessee, I think. And uh, so I had information there on some letters, some correspondence that took place. Um, and after, after that, well, um, in Montreal, that's where I first found him. And that's how I first got on to him, is I was looking through newspapers in Montreal, because that was my interest, was about Black people in Montreal and in Quebec generally. And uh, I was looking through a newspaper called The Pilot on, of 25th December, 1852. And there's this little brief about this character, A.T. Wood, who is claiming that the characters from Uncle Tom's Cabin are his friends in Liberia, and he's just been arrested in England to be tried on uh, soliciting under false pretenses. And it was so outlandish that it, even though it had nothing to do with what I was looking up, what I was researching, I thought, okay, um, I'll hold on to this, you know, I'll make note of this. And just a couple of days later, you know, I don't know if you know, if you're doing research like that, you're going through newspapers so within a matter of days, you can go through several years of newspapers. Well, that's what happened to me. I find this little article in 1852 newspaper. Within a day or two, I see an article or an advertisement in a newspaper in Montreal where A.T. Wood is, uh, is going to give a lecture. Uh, and he's presenting himself as superintendent of public works in uh, Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And you, what is what is he up to? What is this guy doing? Okay. So from, that's where I was hooked, and I wanted to find out what what is this guy all about? Where is he from? Uh, and so it, it started there. But uh, yeah. Webster, you just sort of dig, eh? You keep digging, as uh, as Robin was saying earlier. You become obsessed in your research and you want to get to the bottom of things. You don't want to leave any stone unturned. So you turn all over a lot of stones that you don't need to turn over, but you, you end up turning over a lot of stones and finding what it is you want. Are there, uh, maybe, uh, are there any other questions from Thank the you. floor? The, um, 
because because I have a I have a question, but I, I'd rather if there, people have questions or comments. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, we have a few hands up, so oh, okay. who's okay. who? But whoever said I have a question, you can start. Yes, okay. That's, okay. That's okay. Hi, yeah. nice to meet Thank you. you. Hi, Frank. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi to everyone. Um, yeah, the, the the work is just amazing. I'm just astounded astounded at the amount of the de detective work that you engage in. You you found this man in in three continents. It it's incredible. Um, clearly, he was a genius. Uh, clearly, he was a scammer, and I do agree with Webster's um, introduction earlier about had he had, you know, the the right sort of doors opening for him, what he could have been. <coughs> but clearly, he he was very very smart. I just wanted to know how he learned German, how he learned German enough to write to write that history. Because you had to have some fluency. Yeah in a language no. to do that the thing the thing is he didn't know german and oh, okay. uh, he he these are supposedly the book was translated uh the translation of an english book oh okay uh, but there is absolutely no trace of an english book by a.t wood it claimed to have been published by um a publisher in york england and the name that was given in the um, German version is, it's a bookshop. There was a fellow by that name, but he didn't publish books. He just sold books and stationery and that sort of stuff. So I think what it is, and when you look at the, the book itself, you find certain indications that maybe the, it wasn't a, a published book in England. It may have been like published newspaper reports on some of Wood's lectures, um, but certainly it's like it, it's like a, a collection of his lectures in England on different subjects. I mentioned at one point that he has like one of the lectures he gave in Ireland was about remember now religion or idolatry of the natives in Liberia or something, and he has a chapter in the book is about idolatry of the natives, you know? So it's like, it's like he took lectures that he gave and maybe printed versions. Some of them, it would seem from some signs in the book, it would seem that they were handwritten when they were translated into German. So it may have been a mixture of printed newspaper reports and uh, manuscript archives, but he didn't know German, that's for sure. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Luke, Luke Byrne, Ben? Yeah, um, I'll keep my question brief because I can ask you more about it through Robin later if I need to, but I'm just curious about um, his connection to New Brunswick. And so I was wondering if you knew how long he was in New Brunswick for, what he was doing here and whereabouts in New Brunswick he was. Well, he was, he was in Maine. He landed, he was in Maine from at least the fall of 1846. Uh, there was one account that he gave at one point where he had left England in February 1846, uh, had been shipwrecked off Pictou, Nova Scotia, and then wandered uh, friendless and shirtless and everything uh, until he, he's in uh, Maine in the fall of 1846. Um, he he starts off down in uh, Amherst, near Bangor in Maine, and works his way up. He's sort of a kind of itinerant preacher, or missionary. Uh, and he's finally, he's living up in a place called Baileyville, which is right on the border there, near Callis in Maine, across from St. Stephen in New Brunswick. Uh, he's living at Baileyville, I think. and. Uh, or he's living in Lincoln next door in that area anyways of Callis. And his girlfriend is up there too. She's a, she's a daughter of a uh, pub owner or an inn owner up there. Um, the, only inter, the only New Brunswick uh, episode in his life is when he marries. Um, in May of 1849, he and his... Uh, 
bride-to-be, they cross over to St. Stephen's, which is right on the border, and uh, they are married there in the, uh, in the home of the uh, Anglican minister in St. Stephen's. Um, they, they're married by license, so I don't know if, if there was any kind of requirement that he be living there for a while before getting a license, or if it was just done automatically, you applied for the license and you got it. Uh, but he, he was there to get married, and then they return to Maine. I think he married on May the 2nd, then, you know, within a day or two, they're back in Maine. And, um, and by the, I think it was the Wednesdays when they got married, and he, they go back to Maine, and, uh, and then he, uh, he's a wanted man on Friday, and takes off, and they keep coming for him until he finally crosses the border into Maine, and, uh, uh, and that's where he gets arrested within a day or two. So he's there only for a few days. He doesn't, supposedly doesn't go anywhere else in Maine. That's just, that's the only occasion. Now, the thing is, when he claims to have been shipwrecked off Pictou, Nova Scotia, in, um, uh, it would have been in the spring of uh, 1846, where did he go from there? Uh, did he go into Nova Scotia? Did he go into Nova Scotia, then New Brunswick and spend time in New Brunswick? That I don't know. Uh, the next we hear of him is at Amherst, Maine in, uh, uh, in the, the fall of 1846 when he's hired as a preacher. Thank uh, you, yeah. A vacation from uh, Paul Mackey. Sounds like family to me. Yes, that's my brother. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I that's, asked in the chat, uh, did, did he have any children and, and any children that survived? Well, he doesn't seem to, there's no obvious reference to children. The only thing, there's this mysterious uh, case where when he comes to Montreal, see, he, originally, supposedly, his name was George Albert Smith. When he comes to Montreal, he's still A.T. Wood, um, but he's living with this black, uh, <coughs> sorry, black carpenter uh, called Matthew Bell, who's from South Carolina. He, um, uh, and the, the census of 1861, of course, A.T. Wood is not there. He's long gone. He left around March, 1860. So, <coughs> He's nowhere in some kind of a public list here in Montreal. There's no census record of him. There's no uh, city directory record of him. He's living with Matthew Bell and his wife. Uh, and uh, in the census of 1861, Matthew Bell and his wife and his wife's sister and her, uh, her husband, the French Canadian husband, uh, are living in the house. Neither of them, neither couple has children, but there are two children in the house. One of them is a girl called Elizabeth Williams, as I say in the, in the book, and she's the daughter of this poor couple, uh, uh, African-American man called Samuel Williams and his Irish wife. Uh, and Samuel Williams is dead, has been dead for about two years, and his widow is about to die that April. So when the census is taken, um, she's, uh, she's on her deathbed. And there's this daughter of theirs, Elizabeth Williams, who is living with uh, Matthew Bell and, uh, and his uh, wife and his sister-in-law and her husband. And then there's a boy there and he's identified, the girl, Elizabeth Williams is a native of Canada. Then there's a, this boy who is something like I think five years old. His name is George Smith. And you sort of wonder, there's nobody in this household called Smith. There's, there's Matthew Bell and his wife and uh, uh, his sister and her husband, um, who's, whose name is Seguin, his French Canadian name. Um, and, and here's this five-year-old boy whose name is George Smith. And he's um, a Methodist in religion, born in England, 
born in England, and there's nobody else in the family who was born in England, nobody else in the household. And so you wonder, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> George Albert Smith, alias A.T. Wood, has been living in this house for close to a year. Uh, is it possible that this would be a child of uh, uh, A.T. Wood? You know, where else does a boy that age, that name, uh, that place of birth, where else would he have come from? It's always possible that, uh, that he has nothing to do with uh, A.T. Wood, but it just sounds like it could very well be a son of his. He has no other child. So it's possible that she may have been a, a child of his uh, third marriage. Anyway. Any, uh, um, Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? I think Mary. there's one from Gary Schroeder. Okay. Unmute. <laughs> okay, Frank, I was thinking of the strange similarities between your criminal con man, right? Yeah. And the other famous woman con person, uh, Anna of the King and I, who's buried at Mount Royal Cemetery in Montreal. Yeah. Where her whole life was a lie. <laughs> Everything about her, including her past, her history, her names, her parents' names, and it seemed to stem from the fact that she always tried to hide from everybody the fact that she was of mixed race, mm. that she was that she was uh, born in uh, India. And 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 the bigger the yeah, lie, yeah, yeah. the better it is. It's I mean it's interesting that you bring that up because I never thought of Anna Leon Owens in that while I was writing this book, but. But that's one of the things that was in the back of my mind as I was writing this story is that um, A.T. Wood is like, is like proof that blacks and whites, they're, they're all alike in a certain way. They, it's not because somebody was black that they didn't pull stunts like white people pulled, you know? And they had, there's so much variety in the history of blacks that we we tend to forget, you know, we tend to play them as these poor losers all the time, and you know, victims and that sort of thing. And yet, here is somebody who is certain, you know, but but who is uh, an imposter. And the only reason I didn't use the title of the great imposter is because it's already been used, you know. But uh, but it is true, yeah. That the they there's probably several people. At the time, if you actually research, you would find these kind of games that were played by people of different races, different countries. Uh, but it would take some research to, uh, to sort of identify them all. But I mean, Gary, if you want to write a comparison of A.T. Wood and Anna Leon Owens, go right ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was also the famous Irish Montrealer who was an Irish, Irish ancestry. And he was to call himself Shiloh Quinn and BP Quinn. And he was raising money for cancer research by tricycling from New York to Philadelphia uh -huh. for juvenile cancer research. And of course, the money didn't go to juvenile cancer research. <laughs> and people sent him thousands of dollars because he was going to solve Middle East problems. He's going to meet Yasser Arafat and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, Bernie Quinn from <clears throat> Montreal just died recently. Yeah. There, there is also the very the famous one of the great writers of Westerns, Will James. Yeah. And Will James was name, his real name was Ernest Dufault. And he made up a full story that he'd been raised by a French Canadian family because he could never get rid of his accent. But he, 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 he wrote these great Westerns and illustrated them. It was, he lived in, the, in Western US. And uh, he wasn't found out until after. Uh, yeah. That, you know, that his real name, and he came from saint Hyacinthe. Yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of imposters like that. I mean, there was a famous one in Quebec back at the time of the rebellions in 1837-38 called Félix Poutré. Uh, and Félix Poutré was, uh, wrote about his roles in the rebellions. Uh, and he was like a sort of a hero or others wrote about him. Louis Fréchette, who was sort of a poet here, wrote a book about or a play about Félix Poutré. And so he was 
uh, lauded as sort of one of these patriot heroes and all that until they found out that he was nothing of the kind. He was working on the other side, you know. <laughs> so it's uh, there's a lot of that around. You could you could do a study of uh, of imposters and uh, liars, cheats, whatever. You know? And their uh, and their motivation, because this in this case it is trying to it is interesting, and I think both of you presented <clears throat> what brings people to do yeah. these these kind of things. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's just trying to find a, a way to make a living and, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, I should mention before I forget, when, the, when the, um, Webster, I never know whether to call him Webster or Ali. <laughs> but both, both are good. Both are good. So, okay, when, when Ali was speaking before, I thought he mentioned that we had met at this meeting at the, uh, the Shadow Ramsey. We, had, we were both attending a lecture there one day, and uh, and that's how we met. Um, but uh, one of the things I was doing, and one of the things with this story too that I wrote now, is uh, I think it's very important that this probably be my last words on the subject. It's very important that to get out stories about black people here. It's not like sort of academic books for learned discussion and that sort of thing, but it's to tell stories about black people the same way that in the United States, you know, everybody knows about George Washington and the cherry tree and that sort of stuff. I mean, here you want stories like that. People tend to neglect that simple fact that if you tell stories, uh, it's very important and it's a way of communicating the reality of people who lived here. Now, when I wrote a book back in 1804, which was inspired by my daughter, Rose. <laughs> uh, she's not listening, is she? <laughs> you tell her, Nico. Um, <laughs> um, I wrote that book with the idea of, you know, letting young people know here, it was written in fairly simple language, that people here, kids, black kids would know that Black people had walked the streets for a long time. Um, so uh, that was uh, one of my, I wanted people to read the book and then go out and tell the stories in their own words, you know, so you could tell somebody, uh, you know, I just read this story about this girl and this is what she did and this is where she went and tell it in their own words. My, my goal at the time when I met um, when I met Ali, uh, he told me when he knew who I was, he said, you know what? I wrote a rap song based on a story in that book. And I thought, well, that's exactly what I wanted. That I wanted somebody to take the stories and retell them in their own way, their own words, or whatever. And so he had written this, this rap song. I never would have thought of it. I never would have attempted it. <laughs> But he wrote this rap song based on this story. So uh, I was over the moon when I heard that. Man. And so we've we've hung in together <laughs> ever since then. Are there any other questions or comments? So, well, <clears throat> I have a last word. First of all, I want to thank Frank uh, for submitting it and has confidence in Bar Baraka books. Also, um, Webster as well for agreeing to do the uh, do the do the forward and it enriches the the, the book um, and I'm sure it's going to have a good life. We saw the review in the Gazette the other day. CBC went over it as well. Um, for this launch, I want to thank in particular Blossom Tom, who welcomed you, and she's been uh, organizing our online launches um, this year and last fall as well. Hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to have <clears throat> in-person launches, but sometimes these, these online ones are very good because it manages to reach people who couldn't be here otherwise. If um, I clap, huh? we get the clapping. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and, um, what, and, and um, the person who you don't see is behind the cover is Jan Jorgensen. Um, and she is the one who has the, 
the, the big Zoom uh, account, and she graciously uh, and, and lets us use it. We use it. Uh, since we've used it last fall, we use it now as well, and perhaps we'll keep doing it in the fall. And so without her and without Blossom, uh, this, these launches would be impossible. So if there are any, aren't any more questions, um, then I ask you to have a glass of wine with us. But we can't offer you the wine and we can't offer you the glasses. So have one at, at your homes. <laughs> and um, and uh, thank you very much for attending. And uh, we'll uh, be in touch. Um, and I think we should, we should clap for Frank. And <laughs> yes. for Frank for having done all this work. So anyway, thank you for attending and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>